Hey guys, Toby Mathis here with Infinity Investing. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about Congress insider trading, what's been going on, and more specifically, I wanna take a look at Speaker Pelosi's portfolio, not for the reasons you're thinking, not to bash on her, but actually to show how it's actually fairly well diversified and follows some of the same guidelines that we do at Infinity. It's actually pretty, pretty, pretty hilarious when you look at it. So you're gonna hear a lot about this because there's legislation that's gonna be proposed regarding whether or not members of Congress should be allowed to trade in the markets. And I'm gonna kind of take you back to uh, the 90s and the early 2000s when uh, I was pretty active in the 90s in trading, early 2000s too. And what was so interesting back then is that sitting members of Congress could trade on non-public information. So they were insider trading. And it was perfectly legal. That actually changed in uh, 2012. I think it was 2012. And you had something called the Stock Act. Other than, up, up until that point, uh, Congress was allowed to trade on insider trading. And we had this new act where they're supposed to disclose, but they're not supposed to trade on insider trading. And that brings us to a report that was filed by a site called Unusual Whales. I've actually been following them for uh, since last year. I think they're pretty cool. I think it was maybe two years ago. Uh, but I always like watching who the big, the big traders are. Not because I'm a super active stock trader, but I just find it curious and interesting. And in that particular site, they started tracking and they did a really comprehensive report of all the congressional members who made very unusually timed trades. So for example, and I'm not talking about Pelosi or anything like that here. Like there's, 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 there's stuff that, there's tons of stuff out there in her, but it's the Republicans too. But you, like, let's say we're gonna award a military contract to, uh, to a, an, an aircraft company. So you know this is gonna come down the pike and there's a select committee that's gonna be voting on it. And those committee members kind of know which way it's gonna go right? Uh, or they have their ideas. And if somebody purchases the company that's going to be awarded this contract, you know, a week before the vote, or you see them doing some unusual activity uh, a week before the vote, like buying deep in the money calls and things like that, that shows that they're, they're, they know something that the rest of us don't, and they're using it to profit. And the idea is that, hey, that's really not fair. That's, you know, they disclose it, but it's usually a, a period like a month later that you're going to find out what they're doing. If they disclosed it in real time, it'd be kind of interesting. Like, hey, this guy's doing that. And he sits on the committee, right? Then it would be more publicly available information. But that's not the case, is that generally speaking, you and I don't have access to this information. All right. So that is probably going to go away. If there's fairness in the world, it's going to go away. Nancy Pelosi was specifically asked about this, and she said, no, Congress members should be able to participate in the free market economy. And then I think it was two days later, she was buying more calls on something. It was like, I, don't quote me on that. It was something where she was doing some more trading activity, and she does it through her husband. You know, that's, oh, it's not me, it's somebody else. So they said, hey, create a blind trust where somebody's managing your portfolio that you have no contact with, or better yet, you just have to buy indexes. Like, you're sitting in Congress, like, hey, if you're going to buy something, you should have to buy the whole market. You shouldn't get to pick winners and losers, right? So that seems reasonable to me. It's always seemed reasonable to me. It seems weird that somebody gets to profit off of information that the rest of us don't have. They always look at that as being a perk of being a, a political appointee. But come on, Nancy Pelosi, hundreds of millions of dollars, and she's been a public service, it's, you know, but it's not just her. There's Republicans and everybody, we just pick on her a little bit because it's so crazily blatant. Her husband likes to buy deep in the money uh, leaps, calls basically, on companies that for whatever reason, there's something that's coming out, either action's not going to be taken or, hey, we're passing things that are, you know, strong for electric, com you know, car companies, for example, or we're we're allocating tons of resources, or there's lots of push, or you see activity that's gonna that that's going to be positive for a particular industry, and she happens to be investing in that industry. Not accusing anybody of anything. I'm just saying that that's what's been out in the press, and that's what people are up in arms about. But the one thing I do like is the allocation of uh, Speaker Pelosi's 
portfolio, which is what we're going to follow. So we don't have to worry about that. That's the stock act. But when we use a diversified portfolio at infinity, this is the way that we teach it is we're going to have about 10% for cash and cash equivalents. So I'm just going to say, just put in a quiv equivalents. So this is your crypto. This is your gold. This is your US dollars. This is the kind of the emergency fund. And then you're doing 30%, 30%, 30%. So we have a 10, a 30, a 30, and a 30. And the first 30 is our version of the stock market landlord. It's stocks that are dividend paying stocks. So we tend to just do stocks and options in this category. You buy the stocks, you sell the options. We're not big option buyers. In fact, the only time you should be buying an option is when you buy yours back. You should be the, the option seller in, in our world. So this is where you're doing stocks. And this is 30%. 30% should be in real estate or real estate equivalents, which is like REITs, private placements, etc. The third category, this next 30% is managed money. So I always say managed means you aren't in charge. So this could be uh, a money manager. This could be giving it over to a, an investment advisor who charges you a percentage. It could be an It could be AI. I don't really care as long as you're the one not making the decision and you could see what it's doing or what, what they are doing. So if you have a money manager, the idea is that now you have somebody you can bounce ideas off of or you can see the portfolio. You can see their activity. If they start making changes, you can watch it. It's kind of like, again, if you could watch Congress in real time of what they're buying and selling, that would actually be like, whoa, hey, maybe I should be factor that in. Now that is publicly available information. This is like, hey, if I see a vote coming up on a particular item and I see everybody, I see somebody dumping Boeing, I'd kind of want to know that, right? I'd want to know, hey, there's a, there's a big decision coming up as to who's getting what. You know, is it going to go to company A or company B or company C? And uh, we don't know. And if they start dumping company A and B and buying uh, options on company C or buying company C, then we can be like, whoa, hey, we can see what's going to happen ahead of time. But we don't. So they shouldn't get to, we shouldn't get, you know, but chances are we wouldn't have that information anyway. So you have somebody managing it that's sharing with you, that's allocating your portfolio so that you're not dependent simply on yourself. Now, there is some crossover because you could have private placements over here. You could have even passive business. So I could have things that I don't run. Somebody else runs, you know, hey, I have an investment in a pizza shop. I have an investment in a bio company. I have private investments. That's somebody else managing it. I have a portfolio being managed. That's private investment. I do a real estate private placement. I put money into apartment. It crosses over into here, right? I have, I, I could be easily allocating that there and then say, I'm going to go get more real estate as well. As long as we have a portion of our money somewhere where it's detached from us making all the decisions, I'm good. Now, here's what's interesting. If I took this out and I said, Speaker Pelosi, then this gets very, very interesting. Let's change some of these numbers up a little bit. I'm just going to say, let's take away the 10. You'll see what I mean in a second. Oh, this is just horrible. This is dusty. So I'll just take, actually, I'll just redo the whole thing so you guys can see it. I have my big white cloud here, right? So if we're doing Pelosi, then you have about 5% is in her option buying. 5% of her reported uh, reported income or per, per reported assets and all of her trading activity and her business interests are about 5% of it is in the form of options. About 35% is in, guess what? Stocks. Now, 
Pelosi tends to be more focused on tech. She's in the Bay Area. It doesn't surprise me. She's very, very tech heavy, but she's still in securities, which I, I always find is being pretty interesting, right? You look at it, you say, all right, how close are we in reality when we're doing our allocation model? And then she has another uh, 20, it's about 24 to 25%. I can't remember the exact number that's in real estate. And that number may be going up because she keeps buying more, right? She just bought a $10 million uh, property down there. And uh, I think it was in Jupiter, Florida, uh, right on the coastline, by the way. Not that that means anything, but some of you guys may be finding that somewhat humorous. Um, but there's allocation. Her third category is really her business interests. And the reason I bring this up, it's about 36%. It's because she doesn't manage anything. She's not actively involved in any business. So these are all passive businesses. Business interests. And so is there proper diversification? I found it being pretty interesting at how these things were weighted. And I just thought that would be pretty comical when you look at these things and you see that there's some headlines going on in this area. And what can we glean from it? You know, without demonizing members of Congress, it's like they're just doing what they're allowed to do. If, if, some, if they shouldn't be doing it, we should probably be like, hey, let's make laws against it. Uh, if those laws are easy to circumvent, like, hey, they have access to information and we really can't stop them from using it, then maybe we just say, hey, that you can't, you can't engage in that transaction. Like, there's no way we're going to stop them from knowing this stuff. They're not supposed to use it at the public's expense. Because just consider, if they're making money, somebody else, chances are, isn't. It's being allocated in somebody else is paying a cost for it. So you look at it and you say, maybe they shouldn't be doing it. That's probably going to be the case. But what can we glean from the information? I just look at it because, you know, somebody was naming uh, Speaker Pelosi's, uh, you know, trader of the year because they've made so much money. A lot of it was in Tesla and some of these things in NVIDIA where they were buying deep in the money leaps. And then these companies take off and they make huge, like millions and millions of dollars. And it looks really, really bad, right? Well, okay, did they know something? Yeah, of course they know something. We're going to be allocating tons of money into the, and they know it's going to pass, and they know this thing's coming to pass, and that these companies are going to benefit from it. Um, they could they could make decisions as a result that you and I we wouldn't know that information, or like we're, we'd just be guessing where she knows more on the inside of what's going on, whether that's right or wrong. I don't really care. It's what's been happening, and uh, a lot of people benefit. And by the way, just to be completely fair, more Republicans benefit than Democrats at the top. Like I think it was Dan Crenshaw and a couple others were ahead of Pelosi as far as how much money they were making uh, from trading. So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's always an explanation, right? I'm not going to do the right or wrong thing. I'm just going to say that this came out. And then I found it really interesting at how they diversified it and wanted to share that with you because it happens to be fairly in line with what we teach over and over and over again, which is, hey, diversification, like Warren Buffett kind of says in stocks, it doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense. And if you haven't heard it, go like just Google Warren Buffett on diversification. He says it's better to know a few companies and know what they are, and they're really good companies and own a few of those than a whole bunch of something that you don't know. So why buy the whole market? when you could buy just the good companies. And that's our philosophy. That's why we're always teaching you to buy individual securities as opposed to just go buy ETFs. The ETF people are like, hey, average is okay. I don't want just average. I wanna have good companies that I like and that I wanna keep forever. And that changes my, my thinking. I want companies that have a great track record that in 100 years, I see that they're still gonna be here churning out cash. I can't do that if I don't have enough historical data. So it's really tough to do that with new comp com uh, companies. And when I look at the whole market, uh, uh, you know, the entire market, I want to see as much strong history as possible so that I can make really good decisions. And I can say like, like Coca-Cola, great company. Warren Buffett was, t you know, targeting Coca-Cola in the 80s. Apple, great company. You know, does it pay out a, a strong dividend? Not the greatest, but great company. So we try to pair those two things up. Does, does Coca-Cola pay a great dividend? Right now, not the best, but you watch it until that dividend's up above 2%. And that's telling you that your price is right. Then you might be like, oh, this is great. Walgreens, 3M, Procter & Gamble, 
all trail. Like there's a ton of them out there that you could be tracking. And we we do it in the website, obviously, but you should still be aware of these and be looking at them going, hey, when does the pullback or when does the dividend increase to where it becomes a great deal for me to, you know, it's hard to time, but this is a great deal for me to get in knowing that you're not going to be selling it. You're buying it for a long term. I think Warren Buffett said it was like selling, like, would you sell one of your kids? This is something I love. This is a great company. I want to feel that strongly about my holdings that I will never want to sell it. Barring extraordinary circumstances, you know, the management changes, they're unethical, whatever. But otherwise, I'm buying this thing because I want to hold it for a long period of time. It fits nicely with our allocation model. And that's what I'm just trying to convey to you guys is that when you look at what the most successful investors have done, and I, we use the Yale model, this was what their foundation used. They had a brilliant, brilliant designer of their plan and we use it kind of as a as a as a kind of a dumbed down version easier to use uh but it works really well for our folks and when i see other people doing something similar maybe not even intending to i just think it warrants a call out thanks guys if you like this type of information by the way please like and subscribe to the channel share it with anybody you think would benefit from this information